with the hard ch hey everybody what's going on it's the tatiana show <laughs> welcome i didn't know we were going live so fast yeah we're just hanging out here i'm super excited for the show today um because i have some friends on and we have a lot of fun things to talk about um and i've got josh who's broadcasting to us from my homeland what do you think of poland so far josh Oh, great. That's very interesting. By the way, you're on mute, buddy. <laughs> I can't hear you. All of a <laughs> oh, God. Uh, really? Yes. Now you're yeah. now you're back in the game. There okay. You yeah. Chingui. Well, that's all I know. Chingui. Okay. That's terrible. Yeah, it's not, it's Poland, not like Borat's country. It's Chingui. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, it's wonderful. We just went to the Wolves Summit, um, huge startup uh, thing over here, and uh, talked to some really cool startups. Uh, all, uh, also, some in the blockchain space. It's actually really nice to just go to a general startup conference instead of every time a blockchain conference. Oh, well, uh, you're like the you're so interesting there. I bet everybody wants to talk to you and your blockchain. -y. Yeah, all the blockchain. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's it, uh, I, you know I really notice how many people have blockchain ideas, and they they come and talk to me, and and really I notice straight away they don't know what the heck they're talking about. They have no clue. They're like doing some, they, they give me some grand pitch and they say, oh, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, it's an ERC-20 token. I'm thinking, I can't do what you want to do, dude. Like, it, yeah. It's nowhere near what you need. Uh, and anyway, it, 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 it's all this centralized stuff with the weird token. And the, I don't know. People, I think this is actually a problem with, uh, with regulation is that all these regulations around, around tokenization are forcing people, people to cram utility tokens somewhere in this instead of just having a token that gives dividends, you know, that, which is all they really want. Uh, instead, they need to find some utility and it doesn't work. It's horrible. But anyway, had a great time here in Poland and Warsaw. Uh, definitely uh, worthwhile checking out if you're in Europe. I caught the train up here from Berlin, by the way. It's beautiful. Well, that's that was my plan. I'm sorry to miss it. I heard that there is a really fun Berlin conference, so I'm, I'm sorry to miss it. But um, we shall cross paths again soon, my friend. Very soon, indeed. No, it's a deal. So we've got uh, two of my friends today on the show. Uh, George Burke, who I've been friends with for a really, really long time. He's one of my OG crypto friends. I think even from like 2013 or something. And then exactly. we've got Chandra. And, and Chandra and George are taking over the insurance world with peer-to-peer -peer network called Tides. And I don't know what it is, but we're going to find out today. I, I don't like insurance. I find that it's a, always a ripoff. So maybe they're helping. What's going on, guys? Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Uh, that's a great intro. Nobody likes insurance, except us, maybe. Yeah, well, no. I mean, right. people need insurance. They like insurance after mm -hmm. they get into an accident, as long as the exactly. insurance pays now. So I think there's a lot of problems there. What are you guys trying to do? What's what's the scoop with tides? So I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, when you start to talk about um, why people hate insurance, even though it's an essential need that we have, uh, or an essential service that we all depend on, the problem with insurance is that the insurance company, uh, its business model is that it takes your premiums. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, a bunch of people get together and say, you know, we're all going to have a tail risk, like a heart attack or something. And then we want to be able to afford uh, to recoup the losses or to get back to where we were in life if something bad happens. And to do that, we're going to share risk, meaning like a bunch of us will come together, pull money. And when a bad event happens to one of us, we're going to pay him. And since we don't know who it's going to happen to, that's a fair way to share risk. The problem with insurance companies, though, is they collect your premiums as revenue and their expenses, mostly after administration and other stuff, consist of claims paid, meaning when something happens to you, they need to pay, right? That's kind of the contract that is the agreement that they enter into. However, when you are the insurance company with an organizational structure, a cap table, investors, shareholders, and a board and management, your incentive is to maximize your profit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the only way, unfortunately, that you could do it is by either overpricing risk or uh, meaning increasing your premiums or to deny your claims. And they also do make money off of the float, but that is not a well market, right? By definition, they can't be a super investor. So unfortunately, both of those things, raise, uh, raising your premiums and denying your claims suck for the consumer. 
which wouldn't be a problem okay. if we had a competitive market with many insurance companies competing for your business. They'll compete on price, they'll compete on quality, but we don't have that. We have these local oligopolies in the US. Now in some states you have one insurer or your shit out of luck. That's kind of the situation. You have one Not plan or you're out of luck. That's kind of terrible. So the, the, uh, the thing that we're really doing is if you take a step back, like Bitcoin network actually serves as a model and an inspiration for most of these decentralized project, projects that are done right, right? So what it is that we're doing is we're replacing the insurance organization as a whole. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer, uh, decentralized network where, you know, you can think of an insurance company as a network, right? They have consumers on one side, they have providers on the other side, they have actuaries, underwriters, claims processors. That's basically the five essential functions of insurance. Right? So it's a multi-sided market. If you replace that with an actual network, right? there's a, a pool of consumers who can come together to form a peer-to-peer -to -peer pool to share risk. There's a decentralized network of actuaries, underwriters, claims processors, et cetera, each of them incentivized to be honest and efficient and have no consideration to profits or anything else. Then you start to see uh, wonderful things happen. Like you pay to an insurance pool and you have a claim, it gets validated and you get paid. At the end of the term, if the pool doesn't go bankrupt, nobody's gonna take your insurance money or premiums and float money and run with it because it's not their revenue. It's gonna get distributed back to the members. Oh, wow. Except a small platform fee. Yeah, that's kind of the essential concept. I mean, you wanna replace the insurance company or entity as an organization with an actual protocol layer solution. The, the purpose of that is to make sure that uh, we are able to realign incentives uh, where, where as consumers, uh, we want to actually be consumers of our own health. Uh, exactly. And we can do so when we have the ability to have our unspent premiums returned back to us, which is really something that insurance companies uh, do not do. Because so it's that, that, you get that nothing if you're healthy. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, I didn't croak this year. I didn't break anything. Don't I get some of my money back? That's why people don't even want to pay for insurance. Well, Just Tatiana, that goes for that's poor people. That's perverse incentive problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that goes, think about that yourself goes as a consumer. Uh, you're saying? That, so, yeah, that goes directly think about to being able to, as a to consumer. pay. <laughs> All right. George, I'll let <laughs> you finish. Okay, fine. Uh, so, so uh, uh, that goes directly toward uh, being able to pay for uh, pay for the entire system, which is which is sick. Uh, uh, the young, healthy people uh, called or let's, we can call them the, the young invincibles um, are people in their twenties and thirties uh, who who uh, really don't want to have a a super comprehensive or Cadillac plan type of insurance. They they're really just interested in making sure that they are covered. Uh, in case something happens, which is which is what the traditional uh, definition of insurance is. Uh, although many people are thinking of insurance when they think of when they think of health insurance, they're thinking of uh, I need to go to the doctor and I need to get certain medications and I need to be able to visit the doctor uh, once a month for checkups and and I need this and I need that. Awesome. Um, that's not necessarily what insurance was ever meant to be. Uh, but uh, when you have people who are part of a very overpriced system. Uh, that is sick in itself. Uh, you, you have to have that subsidized by others who are not utilizing the system. Uh, and, and, and that uh, is, is really exacerbated. Yeah. Uh, you have so many costs that, are, uh, that, that, are, that have been skyrocketing uh, over the last several years. Um, one of the reasons for this, or may, maybe the main reason for this, is that it actually is not a free market. It's not a free yeah. capitalist market. Uh, it is a pseudo free capitalist market, uh, which actually does nothing to help us, un unfortunately. So uh, there, there was a rule that was, uh, that was maintained where uh, something on average, uh, like 80% of your, for, for an insurance company, 80% of, uh, of, of premiums that are pulled in must be paid toward uh, medical expenses. So you can see where an insurance company that wants to earn profit must be able to increase their, uh, their, their, their profit. How would they do that? Well, they have to increase the medical costs and they then have to increase the premiums. So that way they can maintain that 80-20 ratio, which really sucks. 
But what can what can an insurance company do also to increase their their bottom line? Well, they can then start to scoop up other vertical v- vertical companies such as uh, the hospitals, and they can scoop up uh, the the insurance. Uh, sorry, they, they can scoop up uh, the hospitals. They can scoop up uh, pharmacies, and they can have a, a, a layered entire vertical that they own. So that way, uh, they don't care about the eighty. 80- 20 profit rule in there because they they can uh, inflate the costs of the procedures themselves that would then allow them to line their pockets. Uh, well, let's, so it, let's it, it's take a, a step back for a second. Like we all yeah. know, insurance is crap, right? So let's let, let's let's all agree on that. How how the how the heck are we going to disrupt this? I mean, how are you guys fixing that? Because the, the problem that I see is that you might have like I, I see people like prediction markets coming along and saying hey we can have a market maker to say insurance company says let's say earthquakes for instance uh, i bet uh, the insurance company said bet on that you will not have an earthquake and you bet that you will and then when you do you win and you win the pot of the insurance and that's sort of decentralized way but you have this problem in health insurance especially because it's very personal and uh, you have to divulge a lot of information to the insurance company. They have to have direct contact with uh, doctors to have some sort of oracle feeding into the blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how does that all work? Have you got what sort of uh, scenarios can you play so out? The, uh, I think you bring up two separate issues. One of them is how does the uh, so the the prediction market thing? It actually works. It's been shown empirically to work very well. You know, when you're able to bet your money, you can move the price, and uh, apparently, you can go uh, reach the truth towards. Uh, you know, you you can tilt the market towards the truth. The problem, though, is prediction markets. Each individual bet that you're making on need to be bootstrapped, and there has to be a critical mass of users. Otherwise, it's totally worthless. That's the problem with most prediction markets. There are not enough people interested in predicting the outcomes mm. of whether or not. Uh, a person living in street A will get cancer. That's never going to work. So insurance is a, is a different kind of a bet. It's the case where you know the class probability of certain events, black swan events, tail risks, etc. And you don't know the case probability, meaning you don't know who's going to get it. But aggregate numbers make sense, are very predictable, especially in health insurance. If you talk about like complex systems like you know earthquakes and tsunamis, the prediction you know, models are not perfect. In healthcare, they're very good. They're highly predictive. The question you were asking, how does it work? Well, it, just, it works just like it works now. Uh, um, a bunch of people come together to form a pool. They commission an actuary or a set of actuaries to price their risk. And the action that you need to do is to submit a comprehensive set of health data to the actuary, completely de-identified, uh, with no personally identifiable information on there and make sure that it is true. That's all you need. The aggregate data will be used by the actuary to model out uh, your premiums and pr- price your risk. So this is and just like policy. a web form, a fill out. Um, right, and- this data never gets onto the blockchain. Only the transaction data for each pool, the amount of premiums coming in and the claims paid out. It's like an input and output to a transaction. That's okay. the only thing the blockchain is for, is the ordering of transactions. It is not for medical records data, all of these useless use cases people tout. They're never going to need to be on the blockchain. It's super expensive, it's unworkable, and yeah. you have problems like HIPAA and high-tech laws that you'll run into yeah. for needlessly putting the blockchain in the middle of this. So, yeah. You know, that private data will be on a federated database somewhere else. It, it is not going to be on the blockchain. A reference to it, maybe a hash of the, uh, the file or whatever. Yeah, right. That be on it. Yeah. That's, all, that's all you need. Yeah. And then the other part of your question is, okay, how, how does the claims process happen? Well, yeah. in our system, the claims process is fairly easy in the sense that, you know, the healthcare facility or the submitter or the provider that is submitting a specific claim, when you go to a doctor, right? You say, uh, he, he tells you, hey, you need an x-ray. And you say, okay, cool. I don't care how the cost is or what the cost is. I don't care who's doing it, just get it done. And he gets it done. Claim submission process takes six to nine months. If the, the, the office or the hospital is lucky, they get paid. That's kind of how it works now. In this system, you go to the doctor, um, your incentives are different. You actually have price sensitivity as a consumer because you know the premiums are going to come back. Think about how different this is, right? In a traditional insurance model, like Tatiana said, you're going to be in the pool. You, you have a 12-month term. 
you're on month 10, you've already paid like $5,000 in premiums. And the only value you get out of it is if you use something, you use a medical healthcare resource. Otherwise, at the end of the term, you get nothing, right? You got to go back and uh, restart your pool. So the longer you stay in the pool, the more your incentive is to get some kind of value out of it, cost be damned. That's your incentive, and it keeps increasing towards the end of the term. In our system, the longer you're in, the longer, uh, the, the more you're incentivized to actually not utilize unnecessary resources. Stay to the end of the term so you could get your premium bonuses back, rebates back. So it's, it's a complete uh, flip. So you go to your doctor, they say, okay, this x-ray you need, it's going to cost 500 bucks. And then you say, okay, why does it really cost 500 bucks? The guy on the street is charging 200 bucks. So I'll go there and get the x-ray and you get it. So you sign the transaction with the price and a specific procedure or service that was provided to you. And then with your private key, the provider also has to sign that transaction to submit it as a valid claim. So it's automatically validated. But a valid provider in the network and a member from a pool don't sign a claim. It is not even picked up, right? Unvalidated claims do not get picked up by anyone. A validated claim, on the other hand, gets picked up by a decentralized network of oracles who then verify that claim against a canonical source of truth. You know, this is the standard library where all medical procedures for all age groups, distributions, hospitals, et cetera, is available with a few clicks of the mouse. And they say, okay, this is not out of bounds. A 25 year old can have a fractured leg, you know, and they can get an x ray, and this is not out of bounds. Uh, the price is reasonable. And there's a straight up, up or down word. It's a consensus word. And that's it. A claim is either worded up or down. Right and on. And payment is made. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, going back to what uh, George was saying about how screwed up it is, um, you know, I think we're. We're also seeing that it's screwing the entire, the entire medical industry. A lot of people talk about how the American system, medical system, is so bad, because and they blame the free market. But really, you mentioned it right. We don't have a free market. The problem is we've never had free markets in health. Yeah, the, the insurance is is a total nonsense. And and funnily enough, like, I don't know too much about Obamacare, um, but because I'm in Europe. Um, Thank but, God. Yeah, but I but what I do what I have heard is that. What happened was they said, "Well, everyone has to be in, uh, everyone has to be able to get insured." So all the young people wait until they're sick, and then every insurance company has to take uh, them on as a customer. So, so I'll tell you, that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's a that's a very perverse way to do it, and that's kind of like the first central. I mean, if you're a bureaucrat, and I'm, I'm hoping that this won't be seen by a lot of bureaucrats. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the immediate impulse or instinct you have to any social or scalable problem is, hey, we need to implement this policy. Right? That's like, we need to mandate that this is what happens. So the, the issue with what, you know, insurance was that before Obamacare, young people were seeing what a ripoff it was for them to get comprehensive coverage. I mean, you're a 25 year old guy, you just graduated college, you're, you got your first job, you're saving, you're trying to climb up the ladder in life, and you're getting shafted with the $600 a month bill, yeah. and the promise is that they'll cover your routine doctor expense, which you don't choose. I mean, who's ever freaking seen a doctor before they were 30? I've never seen a doctor before I was 35. I yeah. barely started going to a doctor like a few yeah. years ago. Um, yeah. Because you feel invincible, and most of the time you're right. Yeah. The real yeah. risk you need to cover is whether you have cancer, or a heart attack, or a car accident, or that the tail risk, the catastrophic risk. So the young people were buying catastrophic insurance and skipping traditional insurance. Like Tatiana said, yeah, why don't I just pay out of pocket? If I need to see my OBG, I'll pay like 150 bucks, but that I don't have to pay $600 a month for the privilege of doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. But that actually, uh, because of the way insurance is constructed, if the only people who, who are paying for comprehensive insu insurance are the people who know they're going to use it, the pool is no longer unbiased. It's a biased pool with only the people with high utilization, expected utilization remaining in the pool. That's the adverse selection we talk about. So eventually, if we had a free market in healthcare, costs for all procedures and stuff will come down because the supply meets demand and market's clear and all that stuff. And even expensive procedures will be affordable, like I've seen in India and other places. But we don't have that. So what the government did was they said, oh, these sick people are not able to get the coverage that they need. So you know what? We're going to force everybody else to subsidize these pools. And the everybody else is young people. 
fresh out of college who don't have any risks and who have little money and so why don't we let you know rip them off because we just gave them a student loan they, that they can never pay back so why don't we rip them off with insurance so they're mandated to join these pools and that started the whole cycle of escalating costs and uh, and you know premiums through the roof and people getting terrible coverage and experience but that is gone now thankfully the individual mandate is gone now so that behavior of young people buying catastrophic coverage and saving money and paying out of pocket career expenses out of pocket is returning you know as you would expect how soon can people try and use this though i mean it's like so it seems like this kind of thing always takes a long time yes uh, and that's mostly because the regular uh, you know the timeline required for uh, getting it through state insurance commissioners etc is usually about a year to uh, a year and a half we're actually working on the first product to help people like us you know younger healthier people uh, for catastrophic coverage who are self employed you know okay oh, uh, independent contractors people working for themselves gig economy workers they're the ones that are really getting shafted because if you were an employed worker you know you an employee 65% roughly of your costs are subsidized by your employer right mm -hmm. if you were to pay the same insurance on a on a uh, insurance exchange you would pay 130% more for an individual plan than if you were an employee 270% more for your family plan if you were uh, compared to if you were an employee so what this forces people to do is abandon entrepreneurship abandon working for themselves and be forced to join um you know uh, their labor markets basically you know working uh, jobs for companies it, it works great for companies it seems to me like um it would be easier to roll out in uh, more of a free market um like especially asia some of these um countries that uh, like the philippines and stuff like that where where there is more of a free market in the medical system and and you see it actually there where people uh, in the in the late 90s started going there for beauty uh, you know cosmetic surgery which was way cheaper and now they've become so good because the free market is pretty mm -hmm. price quality quality goes up prices come down just like your electronics and everything else exactly and, and seems, i've personally seen that happen yeah, in in india over a span of a decade you know oh, yeah. unaffordable procedures which were super expensive like let's take liver transplant right you know way back when liver transplant was a luxury affordable to maybe 5 or 10 people in the country it only happened in one hospital right in private medical centers today every you know minor city has a transplant center and the cost has come down by almost 90% over a span of like roughly a decade and a half wow. while the income the average income has gone up like 3 to 4 times so the affordability has dramatically exponentially increased so that's what you expect to happen when markets work if they're allowed to work as you know so your point is very very right why not um a, a freer market healthcare system well we wanted to try to test the proof of concept in the us because this is what we know best but the protocol is borderless i mean anybody anywhere can actually uh, make this function and we don't put artificial restrictions on companies that are trying to build products on it there's a company that is trying to do the product that i described but anybody anywhere can do a product so george are you a developer as well or what what's your role in this uh, as well as gender how, how do you you know i i i currently wear the hat of a uh, coo and um i i've never been a developer uh i i i know that i would love developing but i'd be way too deep in the weeds to uh to really see the big picture and i know that i would just to get i get lost in it staying up all night just programming uh so no i have to i have to stay away from that kind of addiction um uh, otherwise it gets messy so in order to have the big picture product uh, a pro the big picture uh, pr projection uh, i need to make sure that i'm able to help orchestrate things from the top uh bizdev is uh, is is another uh, talent of mine i think um Tatiana yep. can can attest to that because she's seen me she's seen me go go biz devin all over the place at at uh, conferences for years. Uh and and I've had to do it uh in the past very silently uh in terms of uh in terms of stealth. Uh back uh, back in 2013 when Tatiana and I first met, she kept asking me to uh come on to the Tatiana show. And I kept having to say no 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 I can't. uh because the product that I was putting out at the time I believed was only able to be released because because uh there was no press about it. Uh I was working on the first Bitcoin debit card in the United States. Uh 
Yeah. And uh, in order to get a bank to approve that, we figured that we could not have anyone talking about the fact that uh, FreshPay, which is the name of the company, was going to be putting out a Bitcoin debit card. Yeah. And uh, so I had to do all this, uh, all this biz dev uh, for years, um, silently, without, without any press. And finally, years later, Tatiana is able to invite me onto the show. And uh, we're really happy to talk about what it is that we're building. And in fact, the state regulators um, that we've spoken to are even really pleased that we're putting out a, a type of uh, project that, that, that we're doing at Tides. So uh, I don't have to worry about uh, hiding anymore, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> but how long until we can use it? Because, okay, so first of all, I'm really yeah. surprised to see the regulators are like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I'm happy to hear that. Sure. Good well, way to go. There's some astute yeah, people on so, those teams. But, I mean, getting this passed, I feel like, with the behemoth yeah. of American bureaucracy, like, how can you actually implement it? So, Tatiana, right, what, so, we're, what we're building is basically a backbone. Right. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the technology upon which pools of risk can mm -hmm. self-form with okay. a pool operator wanting to come in and uh, dictate rules that, uh, that people in the pool would like to live by. Uh, say, okay, here is the type of plan or set of plans that uh, we would like to come together and, and uh, be insured under. Who would like to join me in this pool? I already so have a pool. Have... A good one, yeah. big pool. So can they sign up right now? It's an already an organization that does like, they like, they, they're part of that little Christian pool thing where you could like put in money exactly. and like what you guys are talking. Mm -hmm. So I know the guy who's in charge that he's always asking me, can he sign up with you guys right now or how soon could he do it? Uh, no, I mean, unfortunately, we're, we're going to have to wait till second quarter of 2019 for the product to be no! because it, it has to get through the state insurance commissioners and, you know. All right, fine. Yeah, that, that's the, that's the, that's but that's the not that long. In order, in order to, to sign up for an insurance product first. to be able to be, uh, uh, to sign up for uh, what we, and what we, the, the product itself, uh, what Tides is building, uh, will be out a heck of a lot sooner than, uh, than mid-2019. Uh, well, yeah, we our want... platform will be live uh, uh, much sooner than that, but the first vertical, like, insurance product that people can sign up to use, the gig economy thing that, you know, okay. I described, there's another company building it on uh, uh, on Tides, and that's the one that I explained, you know, that I was saying. Will be now available. I understand a little better. Okay, cool. Yep, yep. Yeah. Neat. But, um, uh, we, we wanted yeah. to choose this market rather than overseas because it was really important to fix the thing that, that everyone has looked to. Uh, American healthcare uh, for decades has been, has been the leader in the world. Uh, and it still is in terms of innovation. But, but it's in terms much, of, much, it is much smaller. Yeah. In, in, in terms of the ability to actually get covered here, it, it, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, uh, to well, to, to afford to uh, get get uh, your your health costs covered, so we wanted to. And to your Josh's point to about, uh, yeah, sir, go. On. Yeah, we just wanted to we, we wanted to be able to provide an alternative for people uh, to opt out of the this perverse system um, and start working with a system that can actually work. And if it, if if it works here, it could work anywhere, um, like New York. <laughs> So the big question, the last yeah. big question is: How do you guys make money? How do you guys pervert the system? <laughs> uh, so, so there's a platform fee. Uh, there's a platform fee for every every uh, transaction, meaning like any pool has to pay a platform fee, okay. and a fraction of that actually going goes into a reserve pool that acts as a super pool uh, that collateralizes all of the pools as kind of a re internal re insurance policy for all these type pools. And that's it. So this is this goes back to, well, I don't know if I can actually specifically talk about uh, tokens and stuff, because given how controversial that space is, but you know, we, we, we can, uh, I, I can describe in more generalities, like there's a, there's a platform fee, any pool that comes in that pays premiums into it. Um, it is not like a insurance company rent extraction, but it's a small platform fee for the service. And any uh, developer that wants to build a product on top of the platform um, also pays uh, a portion of his revenue, like a small fraction of his revenue, to the platform. Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I can just say that uh, we, we have a currency that our, that our system runs on, which is Tide. And this cryptocurrency 
uh, it is very important for us to make sure that uh, that we are able to build in uh, the uh, maximal value of that currency. Right. So well, the uh, the more important question I think Josh you were alluding to is like okay what do these tokens represent and why should they have any value right the way we think about tokens is these cryptocurrencies so you talk about Bitcoin Bitcoin actually represents when you take it to its logical conclusion a fraction of the value of the Bitcoin network whether you consider it a store of value or medium of exchange whatever it is yeah it's a fraction of the value of the bitcoin network the and that has value because people value certain attributes and money right yeah. Yeah. so a well designed cryptocurrency sh should actually capture a fraction of the entire lifetime value of the network that it, that it runs on and same thing with uh, same thing with times you know you see a ton of protocols where the token use is entirely optional anybody could fork it there's no barrier and then put a token on top or you don't even need to use a token but that's that's really not the, the best use of blockchain or tokenization so it tied you well yeah that that's that's really cool tatiana you got any last questions um Who's working on this project with you guys? How did you guys end up in the insurance space? Because, George, you weren't from the insurance space. Uh, I am in healthcare. I'm a doctor by training. And uh, I've seen this and I've consulted for companies that help doctors actually get paid when their claims get denied. I've seen insurance from multiple sides. And learning more about crypto and how uh, actually Bitcoin framework and the crypto economic system behind it and all of that stuff. Uh, you can't help but see parallels because this is a you know one of the things the blockchain does is of course it enables trustless transactions but where are trustless transactions most necessary when people come together to pool their assets for a specific function and then you don't want to have counterparty risk you don't want to have uh you know economic arbitrage where like their intermediary captures the value because they can and uh they start extracting rent from people who pull their assets so insurance is an obvious use case uh, but within insurance, specifically health insurance, because it's so broken. I mean, auto insurance is not that broken, right? I don't think anybody will argue property and casualty is terribly broken. There are markets that work well in those things. Health insurance, on the other hand, is ter is terrible, as you know. So, you know, yeah. you you have a good application and a and a market that needs to change. And when we talk to people, when we talk to customers, they're all like so upset about their insurance situation. They're looking for better solutions. But Petnas and the and the Blue Cross Blue Shields don't seem to uh, be interested in doing anything. They're they're sitting happy. Well, I hope that uh, I hope that we see some changes in our lifetime because I personally have experienced uh, terrible insurance woes, and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know it's super stressful when you don't have health insurance either. You know, and that doesn't. That's yeah, not we the ask customers, you know, care. what's your best insurance experience? They can't tell me. <laughs> one instance where they were happy with their health insurance that's how bad it is yeah i could i yeah. could probably test that yeah i don't see why that yeah i can't think of a single thing that health insurance ever did that I was like oh good job guys <laughs> sure. um, I, I was i was speaking at a, at a conference the other day uh and i asked the audience a question hey uh if you uh don't hate your insurance then stand up out of your chair nobody stood up out of their chair or maybe just nobody wanted to get up. I don't know which. Maybe they were a little <laughs> lazy by the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, uh, the, the, it, the when there's a disintermediation uh, type of business model, uh, you want to pick an industry that is generally hated by the consumer. And that's a really important thing to, to choose, one that has a really big impact that uh, that is widespread. Uh, and 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 can um, and can trickle down even further than than what you've built yourself. Uh, so you know, we wanted to build a platform that would allow others to create their own pool of risk, uh, that to to opt out of a system that just does not work well. And I think that that in order for us to become stewards of our own health, uh, consumers of health, this is the this is the the option that can realign uh, the incentives uh, between patient and, uh, and, and payer, uh, which is allowing us to become our own insurer, uh, which is really the only way that, that allows for uh, us to fully, tr I guess, trust ourselves when it, when, when it comes to making good decisions about health. 
uh, ra rather than yeah. allow yeah, the, the, the provider and the, and, and the insurer uh, to, to run against behavior. it. I mean, the whole medical, Tatiana, do you know what? I just want to pay my doctor when I'm, when I'm actually healthy. That, that's, that's, I reckon, the best way to go. Because when I get sick, he doesn't get paid. So keep me healthy, fool. No, I don't know. I think, we're, <laughs> I think that's opening up a whole can of work. <laughs> no. All right. Thanks, guys. So how can people find out more about you? Where can they go online to, to catch up and, and to learn more about the project? Join the community. Uh, tides.network is our domain. And if you want to get the white paper, you could, you could uh, ask for it on there. You could also join our Telegram room to get product updates and any news or PA, you know, uh, about Tides. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, I mean, we had a good time. Hopefully, our, our audience learned a little bit about the insurance business. Not all of our audience is a crypto audience. So I like, you know, giving them an opportunity to learn about stuff that's directly relevant. Uh, so thanks very much. And I hope I'll see you guys soon. When's the next conference that I'll see you guys at? I think it'll be. It might be work. consensus. Oh, actually. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. L.A. Are you, are you coming out to L.A.? No, I'm not going to L.A. I'm, okay, I'm then I'll see you. Th then I'll see you at Consensus and uh, and maybe uh, Ethereal in New York. All right. That sounds great. I love you guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Thanks so much for coming Thank on. You. Awesome. So, Josh, <laughs> thank you so much. So, Josh, we're going to bring on Sunny Ray, and we're going to talk about this conference I'm going to do in Toronto. But before we do, do you want to talk a little bit about our sponsors? Because, you know, if, if people, nah. by the way, if you have a product or service that fits with our show, you can always reach out to us for sponsorship. Uh, just go to Dave at BTC Media. But uh, D D btcmedia.org. So who are our sponsors, Josh? We've had some really hardcore people supporting the show forever. Tell yeah, us about Yeah, well, Sovereign Tech. I really love Brian's work. He's, uh, you know, a great podcaster, great listen, always a good thing. Um, we've got um, we've got Third Key Solutions, uh, great, fantastic solutions for uh, especially estate planning. You know, in the crypto space, yeah, you might have a, a whole lot of crypto and you haven't planned for your estate. If something happens, and I'm, it's an awful thing to think about, but you should think about it. So go check them out. Freeross.org as well for Ross Olbricht. He's running there in prison for Nout for uh, basically building a website. Yeah, uh, it's so his fifth the, birthday. Just passed. His fifth birthday, guys. You know, he's sitting there and, and he's really in a prison now where he, where he hardly ever gets to see the sun and stuff. So. Make sure you visit freeross.org and uh, send some money, send some love, send whatever you can. By the way, um, about Free Ross, so next week we're going to start doing something new on the Tatiana Show. Once a month, we're going to have Lynn Ulbricht as one of our co-hosts. Oh, and we're going to have the guests be themed around, you know, the drug war, criminal justice, uh, that kind of, you know, freedom, technology, security, blah, blah, blah. But all and and then Lynn will be weighing in, so I think that'll be fun next week. She'll be joining us, and there's some big decisions being made at the Supreme Court this week in terms of whether or not they'll accept Ross's case. So we'll wow. be getting an update from her about that on next week on the 17th. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, really quick, I want to make sure that we don't forget about the Bitcoin CPA. I know Kirk has been working on my taxes. I have to ask him how many millions I owe the government. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's a good good person to get on your team so you don't end up. Um, definitely. And Voltoro.com, of course, if you want to trade Bitcoin and physical allocated bullion in a high security vaulting facility in Switzerland, fully insured, not like Tether, fully audited, not like Tether. And it's a full <laughs> order book exchange. So, um, so you can trade in and out of physical bullion. It's uh, in, your name is your property. So if, some, uh, if we go broke as a startup, it doesn't matter. Your gold is off of our order book. So liquidators won't be taking away any of your money. I'm still waiting uh, for my Mt. Gox money loss, so the liquidators are having fun with my cash over there. But with gold, you can always have it delivered. Very nice, very good. So uh, also, let's not forget Crypto Compare. You guys have like a little partnership going, right? Yeah, you can always, uh, we, they use our API, so you can compare all your crypto to actual physical bullion and see how much that's worth. You know, why keep comparing your crypto to fiat? We got into crypto to get away from fiat, folks. Why we keep comparing it? Let's get preach, back to preach, after. brother. Tell them, tell them how it is. And also, Crypto Media oh. Hub. If you guys want to uh, check out my website, it's uh, cryptomediahub.com. We just did an overhaul on the site, so we're pretty excited. And uh, we do marketing, PR, 
community management, social media, content creation, and all sorts of things for the crypto space. Now, yeah. without further ado, because I feel like that was a very long pitching section. Yes. I feel like we should have included some dirty jokes in between to just keep people engaged. Um, but that's that's for next time. We're going to have Sunny Ray come on, and I'm going to see Sunny next week. We're going to be hanging in Toronto. Uh, Sunny, thanks so much for making the time and joining us on the Tatiana Show today. Thanks for having me. Tatiana, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, is it you? that cold? You have to wear your coat on the inside in Canada. This is what I can expect. I looked on the I looked on the weather report. Listen, uh, it's actually it's mildly pleasant outside, but um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm actually not a huge fan of the cold. So I, I oh, okay. Overdress. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, you just want to stay nice and toasty. I understand. So, Sunny, you are from Uno Coin, and you're also doing this event. You've been involved mm -hmm. in the crypto space forever. Why don't you give our audience a little bit of feedback about your backstory, and then we'll jump right into what what we have planned for Toronto. Cool. Um, okay, so real quick, uh, born and raised in uh, in Canada. I did electrical engineering, um, and so about 15 years ago or so, I also ran my I ran a financial brokerage in Toronto. Um, and then before the crash in 07, 08, I ended up leaving that space and I spent the bulk of my career, almost eight years in robotics. Um, I worked wow. for a company called Quanzer. I, I traveled the world, um, essentially selling really fancy robots to, uh, Stanford, MIT, Georgia Tech, you know, IIT, you name it. Um, and so, um, and so that job eventually took me out to India about six years ago or so, five or six years ago. And um, I ended up settling in Bangalore at the time, just because the weather was super pleasant, and all the all the other fellow geeks seemed to be there. Um, and uh, and and around that time, I stumbled across the Bitcoin white paper on Twitter. And uh, um, oddly enough, I actually got to meet Jack Dorsey yesterday, and I, and I got to thank him personally for 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 building Twitter so that I could find Bitcoin. But uh, but anyway, so I, I actually um, uh, didn't have any friends in Bangalore because I'm from Toronto originally, and I was super passionate about Bitcoin, and I only wanted to hang out with people that were Bitcoiners. And so I essentially started the first uh, Bitcoin meetup group in India. It's called indiameetup.com forward slash India Bitcoin. And that to this day, I think is one of the top maybe five Bitcoin meetup groups in the world. And so with that meetup group, we just uh, we would just meet. And, and unlike, you know, maybe a lot of other Bitcoin meetups where people meet in like basements and coffee shops and whatnot and bars, uh, we just decided that we would meet at the fanciest like five star hotel uh, in, in India, in Bangalore. And it was called the Lila Palace. It was just like the most beautiful hotel ever. And and the reason behind that was is that uh, for me, I just thought, think the world of Bitcoin. And so I just wanted everyone to bring their A game. And, you know, if you're going to come out and spend some time, why not do it in style? And so we would get bankers, entrepreneurs, students, professors, you name it. And, and through that, um, you know, really kind of got the hang of explaining Bitcoin and and one question we could never quite answer, um, and by we, I mean, so about six months or a year after I started doing those meetups, I met a gentleman by the name of Sattvik, who's the CEO of Unocoin today, uh, and Harish and Abhi, who are my three co-founders. And at the beginning, we just started doing everything. We built, um, you know, a large scale, or actually not large scale, but at the time it was, you know, for fairly large uh, mining operation. We did uh, the biggest probably Bitcoin conference in India, um, definitely at that time, even maybe to this day. Um, and we did uh, we did a whole bunch of things like physical Bitcoins. And, and the common denominator, I would say, was, you know, um, failure in the sense that, you know, they, they, you know, we didn't really find any sort of product market fit. There was no real business to be had um, per se. But we knew that there was something there. And, and the one funny thing was is that we would always get people coming to our meetups with like, you know, not always, but oftentimes enough with bags full of cash saying they wanted to buy Bitcoin. And at the time we thought, well, this might not be the safest way. So we said, hey, why don't we, you know, take a stab at this and actually try and build a, a brokerage. So we essentially, the Unocoin in December 2013 at our own conference <laughs> uh, called the Global Bitcoin Conference, we launched Unocoin. So that's about four and a half years now. Um, you know, we have about a million and a half users, um, about maybe six months into our journey, we had uh, DCG, which is Barry Silbert uh, Invest. Um, we also uh, came came um, through Boost, sort of uh, part of the Boost alumni. So Boost is backed by uh, the Drapers. 
um, Funders Club, which is an early investor in Coinbase, um, you know, so on and so forth. And then, um, and yeah, and so now we're at a point where we're at about 150 employees, um, you know, we're, we're, our mission was to bring Bitcoin to billions and we're not quite there yet, but, uh, but, you know, we're on our way. Um, you know, one quick thing before I talk about maybe Toronto and all that I wanted to mention is, is that, uh, you know, for your listeners and that one, actually, have you heard of what's been going on in India as of the last few days? No, what's happening? So there's been some new developments. I mean, you know, dealing with obviously regulators and banks is something that's been integral uh, up until now for our business. And so, um, however, on the flip side, a, a couple days ago, the RBI. So I noticed in your in your in your notes for this meeting, uh, number four was you know talking about the banks, the largest attack vector in the crypto space. So I thought I would bring this up in relation to that point. Um, so the, the Reserve Bank of India, the central bank, has essentially issued a notice saying that banks are no longer, as of three months from now, no longer allowed to work with companies like ours. Wow. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. I heard that. That's crazy. Great. So, uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, good question. Uh, patiently. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, there's a lot of ways. I mean, so the, I mean, there's obviously the the initial, um, you know, the fact that we have like a so so Bitcoin. So we, we even though we were one of the first to kind of launch in India five years ago, we're by no means the only company. Um, you know, there's many Bitcoin companies now in India. It's a very, it's a you know, it's a it's a it's a prospering industry. I would say, um, and so. Uh, there's a entity called the BACC, which is like an industry body that all of the companies, uh, including ourselves, are a part of. So, you know, part of is part of it is obviously you know taking legal action and whatnot. Um, and that's something that's undergoing. Um, you know, there's obviously discussions in terms of communicating with different regulators and trying to see what changes can be made. But, um, you know, at the end of the day. You know, us companies can say what we want, but it's really about the people. So I don't know what your viewership is like in India, but if there are others in India, I mean, we have a million and a half users. We estimate there's between 10 and 20 million users across India. If those people are listening to this, um, this is their time to stand up and they should really um, make their voices heard. There are petitions out there um, as well. But um, yeah. I mean, what about maybe, all these five rupee notes? Well, maybe everyone could go there with a five Say that again? What about all the five rupee notes that got... Uh, was it the 50 or oh, five? you mean five oh, you mean 500 and 500, rupees. Oh, sorry 500 yeah did um yeah, uh, what about it well can they can they yeah, where, where, did you see a lot of those coming to the exchange at that time uh, uh, so, to... so so here's the curious thing is is we never touched cash ever yeah. we only dealt with banks and our reasoning behind that was is that we just felt like if we worked within the banking system and never touched cash then you know, things would be more traceable, we could work uh, more with regulators. And if, you know, nefarious actors were misusing Bitcoin, um, governments and banks could kind of, you know, have a grasp on it. However, since this new news, you know, companies like ours um, are going to have to perhaps look at, you know, cash much more closely yeah. um, and, you know, doing maybe KYC and whatnot. But but really, that's uh, that's kind of the position we're in now. Um, I mean, so it's going to be, yeah. Become a yeah, bank. Right. I mean, you, you have these stores where people bring in their cash, get credit on their thing. I mean, India is mostly a cash economy anyway, right? I mean, most people are unbanked. This is why this is why I'm smiling, right? Because like you know, I shouldn't be technically because you know this is not a great situation. But you know, I mean, I don't think anyone gets into Bitcoin um, not knowing kind of what the risks are, and and this is something that, you know, I think day number three, we had 30 people from the tax department, you know, a week after we launched our company four years ago, four and a half years ago, the RBI had issued its first notice, you know, um, so we're, we're used to this, but, um, but yeah, anyways, so, so yeah, I, I like, I like your energy, and I like your ideas about, you know, being your own bank, I, I think eventually, you know, as uh, as banks push back more and more, um, entrepreneurs like myself and, and thousands of us around the world are going to start putting our capital to work, putting our energy, our time, our resources towards, um, you know, essentially creating completely parallel systems. And and we thought, you know, our thesis for the last five years was that maybe we could work within the system, um, but that's proving to be harder. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Poland, uh, Poland just released uh, yesterday that the government's going to tax every single transaction, 1% on every Bitcoin transaction. 
means that uh, you know everyone's leaving now, Paul. I, I was talking to the other blockchainers; uh, they're all heading off. And I think this is part of the arbitrage. Wait, 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 wait. What happened? Poland is doing the same thing. Wait, Poland's no, trying not, to charge one percent. No, they're not ban banning it, but they're charging one percent on every trade. So if you trade, you know, hundred k once, that's one uh, percent of that you got to pay, and then you trade it back. It's another one. So trade that ten times, you owe ten grand. So it, it's you know it's really uh, quite unfortunate, but this is the play, this anarchy around the world of, of different people playing and countries having different uh, regulations is that the brains are just going to go to places where it's more unregulated. And this is the future of financial technology. Guys. I mean, come on. Where, this is a renaissance of financial education that we're seeing here, where people are seeing like, oh, Bitcoin and, uh, you know, Litecoin, how many are issued? They're asking questions like, how many are issued? Uh, who's issuing them? What's the sort of issuance? Um, you know, they're asking all these questions. And then you go to the US dollar and say, well, who's issuing them? Uh, no one knows. Really, how many are they issuing? No one knows. It's in the dark. Oh, so it's really a shit coin. And, and then they, they start not really wanting to be part of that system. So eventually, everyone's going to head to crypto. It, it, it's just inevitable. It, yeah, it might be a long time off. Um, but So here's the irony. I want to I share one more thing with you is that so in that same article where they said that they're, they don't want banks to work with virtual currency companies, they also announced that they're going to be launching their own digital rupee on some blockchain or something like that. And so yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And, and well, literally uh, on the same day, I just read the article today, literally on the same day, there was an article that came out where 10 police officers in India went and beat up some entrepreneur, held a gun to his what? head or something like that. For what? And tried to tried to take 200, or I think they did take 200 Bitcoins. It's on Coindesk today. You can read about it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it's you know, like I said, it's, it's trying times. Um, so what is it? The, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. I think we're at the, then they fight you part. You know, with I all think the, so too. You know, the I don't know if that's ads, the order. The banks, the governments. I mean, it just, it feels that way. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, I mean, last year Bitcoin went up like 20X. So it's, I guess not, you know, too much of a surprise. But, but you know, that, but, but that's another thing. Like I, I bought my first Bitcoin at like, I didn't, you know, hold it obviously just, just before I even say the amount, but I bought my first Bitcoin at like $10, right? I mean, obviously sold uh, many times in between just because, yeah. I, I mean, even though I knew it would do well, I never realized that it would do this well this quickly. But I just wonder, like, how many, you know, like, how many, how much wealth have have we been able to uh, act as the catalyst for in India? How many mm -hmm. people maybe use our platform to become millionaires or even hundred thousandaires or whatever it is? Oh, right. And now that opportunity is going to be robbed um, of people from India. Like, how many freelancers use our platform so that yeah. they can get more money in their bank account and faster? We pay many freelancers. Yep, in Bitcoin and, and so Bitcoin. many tens of thousands, right? Tens yeah. of thousands. Um. So, every anyway. So so I think I think those are the people. It's their time now. I think if, if they were you know benefited by Bitcoin, if they felt that this is something that's you know open and transparent and all that, like if, if they believe in that kind of future and they want India to be a part of it, then um, it's it's immensely well, important that people speak up. Really what I see it doing eventually is that people just don't go through the banking system. And, and I've, seen, I've talked to a heap of people now where they'll cash out into fiat and the bank will just freeze their accounts. And then they'll take three months of sending everything under the sun to them. But meanwhile, the bank's speculating. And, and sometimes I think it's actually, especially with some of these new fintech startup banks, it's mm -hmm. actually part of their business model is to just freeze accounts and then hold that for a while. And um, yeah. You know, it sounds very conspiracy theorist, but it's actually it's actually makes sense. And um, and so what's going to happen? And I see this driving more and more is that when a, a programmer gets Bitcoin, he just spends that Bitcoin as Bitcoin. And this is not only what, what what's happening is that the banks aren't banning us, but the banks are actually causing us that we're going to start using our economy and we're not going to go back to their economy. Yeah, could be the case. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Okay, so anyway, so um, not to you know be all morbid and dark about this. Uh, let's. I'm like uh, it's terrible <laughs> news. Great, great way to finish out a show, guys. Uh, let's talk about no, this but, conference. What's our? Oh, what is our hope? No, I mean, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think it's uh, it's all terrible, but I do think you know, like I said, you know, people can't just sit at home and just watch YouTube videos. Like you have to take action, <laughs> and that's how right. you're going to change the world. And so I think on that note, it's positive. And like I said, you know, if this would have happened five years ago. Maybe there'd be a few hundred people or a thousand people in India. Today, there's tens of millions. So 
if a few people stand up, others will follow and, you know, something might happen. If not, it's going to go to another country. So let's talk about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm Canadian because um, uh, my parents are from India, but I'm, I'm born and raised in Canada. And so um, about two years ago or so, a year and a half ago, I, I just, uh, so I, I, um, I have family, I have two little babies, two little girls. And so I just started spending more time in Canada. Um, I traveled back, just got back from India um, a few days ago. I spent a lot of time in India still, but I, I live in Canada um, quite a bit at a time. And so um, I noticed when I came here that there's so many meetups, obviously there's Bitcoin meetups, but the thing that kind of bugged me was that I never could go to a meetup where everybody would be there. Where like, you know, all the old timers and new people and people from abroad and, you know, like everybody, right? Young people, old people, like professionals and professors and everybody. And so, so that was kind of the goal was, is like, I, um, I saw an opportunity to just not do events every week or every month, do it every three months with the explicit goal to essentially, um, to do events that people would look forward to and that people would look back, you know, to and be like, oh, that was an awesome time. That was kind of more like the, the, the simple goal, but the larger kind of goal was we wanted to eventually over the next 10 years or so, um, you know, not give birth to, but be a catalyst for at least 10, uh, you know, billion dollar plus blockchain companies. And in uh, even two years, like, I mean, I'm not going to say we obviously created these companies, but if you look in Toronto, there's some serious stuff happening. Yeah. And so, so, so we, we like to believe that we're part of that. I mean, I could tell you about maybe 20 to 30 people that have gotten their jobs in the blockchain space because of our events. Um, you know, and so, 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 like I said, we do them every three months. Um, we, the last one we did, and, and but we do these in India as well. Um, the ones in Canada are a little bit different in the sense that, you know, because we're in Toronto, um, a lot of the, you know, um, kind of big names obviously are in New York, San Francisco and Toronto and whatnot, like with Vitalik starting Ethereum here. And there's a lot of buzz, Anthony DiOrio's here. And so, um, so what we've done with our Toronto events is we've just invited, you know, so, so, so one benefit that I have is because, I'm like 24 seven Bitcoin for the last six years. Um, I know people like Tatiana and Edmund Moy, you know, who was our, our keynote speaker last time. He was the 38th director of the US Mint. Um, we had him come down. So I know all these like awesome, smart people. And so, you know, it costs a lot of money for me to fly around the world and meet these people. So my goal was, was instead of having all my friends in Toronto um, to, you know, have to fly it and re-experience what I'm experiencing, my goal is to just bring all those people to Toronto so that at least once every three months, you know, we could have a little party. Um, so that's kind of the event. We, so we started, like I said, two years ago, first event, four people around a coffee table. Our last event was maybe six, 700 people at least um, at the Sheraton in a 60,000 square foot hall. You know, it's like a full out conference and, and yeah, and the website's fintechcan.ca. Um, Tatiana is going to be performing this time around, which I'm super pumped about. Uh, Don Tapscott is going to be one of our keynote speakers. We've got Max Kaiser. He's also an investor in UnoCoin. We've got, um, you know, people like Chris Bernisky, who just wrote the book called Crypto Assets. And we've got like 35 other crazy speakers. And, and you know, the goal, again, for these conferences is not like, you know, to try and make money or whatever. It's more just to give back and, and to just like get everyone together, you know, because like we spend so much time on computers and reading and Twitter and this and that. Like for me, you know, the only way I, I know how to build businesses and to do meaningful things is when I like sit face to face with people and have, you know, conversations. And, and so I think that, so that's the kind of ambience we try and, you know, produce like a place where you're going to find your co-founder, a place where you're going to find your next job, a place where you're going to find maybe your investor or whatever. But it's like, but it's got that community feel. I bring a lot of like hardcore Bitcoiners because I'm, I'm one of them. And yeah, and we also explore, you know, ICOs and things like that, that I'm not publicly a big fan of, but, you know, we try and embrace that because, you know, it's, it's a big part of the movement. So, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Well, I want to know like what companies are going to be there. So you've got Don, oh, so, who are your sponsors? So, Let's give them a little bit of love because they're sure, the ones sure. that are helping to make this possible. Plus, yeah, I want to know absolutely. which of my friends are coming because I know you have Connie from BitGive coming and Elena yeah. from Trezor. And uh, yes. we're basically representing with like a lady posse coming from from the house that we rented. Um, I'm bringing you all not only not only smart and capable women, but beautiful ones, too. So um, really excited. I'm, I'm bringing one of our new 
our new teammates uh, to the conference. That'll be her first crypto conference. So that'll be fun. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I appreciate all the help you've, you've given as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch. So like I said, Max and Stacey, we've got, uh, like you said, Connie, uh, we've got Adam back from Blockstream. Um, and I've been trying to get him to come out to Canada for, for some time now. And so I'm super pumped about him. Um, as you know, he's coded in the Bitcoin white paper. I mean, he's uh, wow. just a legend. We've got Zcash with Paige. Um, she's coming from oh, Zcash. Neat. Yeah, we've got um, Oliver from Bit. Uh, he's coming up. We've got Marshall from Metal. Hosho, Hartej is coming. So oh, I love Hartej. <laughs> <He's>, I <laughs> love Hartej too. Um, yeah, a whole bunch. We've got, uh, who else? So, the, and there's a lot of local players too, right? So there's a company called Coinberry. They're one of our sponsors. They're kind of like the Coinbase, I guess, of Canada are trying to be like that. Um, they have ATM machines and whatnot. They're they're one of the sponsors. Another the sponsor is uh, Scrumble. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're like a crazy awesome company. Um, they're actually they're actually launching a like a blockchain powered like secure uh, private communication you know software protocol that's gonna. Um, you know, be powered by blockchain, right? So it's going to allow people to communicate video, text, um, again, privately. Um, and so, so they're going to be, they're going to be doing, they're going to be sponsoring. We've got um, Majestic. We've got, so there's, um, yeah, I mean, I definitely, if you go to fintechcan.ca, we've got all of our lists. We've got a list of all of our speakers. Um, I'm going to make an update today. We've got a few more great speakers. Um, AML Shop's going to be there. Um, and, and so the way the, the way the day is kind of set up is that um, from like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., we essentially have a series of, um, they're not lightning, they're like they're more like 20 minute long talks. Like I've done a lot of research on this and I've found that 20 minutes is like the optimal period of time that you <laughs> can keep somebody's attention. Anything yeah. longer, anything shorter, it's just weird. But we, do, we literally have, uh, we have three rooms. So the first room is more like uh, focused towards networking. Um, it's got like an expo kind of feel to it. Um, there's uh, there's going to be booths, there's going to be food and whatnot. The second large uh, room is going to be our main room where we're going to have a series of speakers. So that's where Don's going to be uh, keynoting, Chris and Max. Uh, they'll be doing their fireside chat. And then the, and that's what Tatiana will be present. Uh, sorry, she'll be uh, singing as well. Super excited about that. And then in the, um, in the third room, uh, we're going to do a series of workshops. There's going to be more like hands-on workshops where we're going to literally bring out Bitcoin miners. We're going to have ATM machines. We're going to have cold, uh, you know, I mean, cold storage, uh, hardware wallets and whatnot. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, uh, and so, uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of how we've arranged it. And like I said, great. Like, so are there still tickets? 20 minute talks. Uh, yeah, we still have to, we still have tickets left. Um, there'll be there'll be a twenty minute talks, and then one thing I want to just uh, finish saying is is that from six p.m. to nine p.m. So in the evening, um, we have kind of a larger crowd because people from people who work during the day who can't kind of come out during the day come for that part, and for that um, we usually do a series of panels. So and those panels are a lot of fun because we try and put people with opposing, you know, beliefs on like tone vase with like a bunch of people doing ICOs. <laughs> oh, great. That'll be fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got to get tone back on the show. I need him to tell me about all the scams. I was on his show. That really? was good. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. I'm glad. He's a, he's a good friend. So I'm happy. Awesome. Oh, yeah. By he's the way, I, there's yeah. an unofficial party, I believe, at the Banya the next day. Cool. The Russian Banya. So hopefully we'll we'll all get a chance to hang out. Oh, that reminds me. I got to bring a bathing suit. Oh, yeah. everybody better remember that. All right, cool. Cool. So, yeah. so anything uh, else that our that our listeners should uh, should hear about just before we jump off? Any kind of final words to encourage them to come and hang with us? Oh, <laughs> George, are you gonna? Where did you even come from? <laughs> George, did you? Are you coming to Toronto too? Come to Toronto. No, we could have a we could do a New York Banya too, but uh, but we're gonna do one in Toronto too. So yeah, that'll I'll be, be fun. There. I'll be a consensus Enjoy as well. It. All right, bye guys. Bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Uh, yeah, so that's on April nineteenth. Uh, it's called Blockchain Economic Event. If people want to check that out, um, right. you know, and uh, and for people in India, Unocoin.com. I'm sure a lot of people already know, but Unocoin.com is uh, where you can buy and sell Bitcoin. Um, you know. A pivotal point for I'd say Bitcoin in India right now, and uh, yeah, so that's it. Fantastic. And, uh, and, well, and my 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 personal Twitter handle is Sunny Startups. So I, I I tweet <laughs> a lot, and so uh, yeah, people can get in touch with me there. Sorry, you were asking me something. 
No, right on, man. I, I, I always forget yeah. to, to talk about Twitter too. If you want to follow us, we're at Voltoro. That's Volt as in gold, Volt, and Oro as in gold for Spanish. And uh, of course, Sunny and Tatiana, you're tweeting like galore as well. Tweeting it up uh, from Queen Tatiana and Crypto Media Hub, uh, both those those handles. So yeah. Oh, by the hey, way, Joshua. so we've got... Hey, Joshua, okay. so I got a quick question for you. So uh, are you guys live in India? Yeah, yeah, we got plenty of Indian clients. Yeah, and they, they because you know it's such tradition of gold. Um, they really, you know, and and not being able to go back to fiat, it's great for them and fully insured and audited, so they, they love it. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I mean, we should uh, connect offline. I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, definitely. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Right. I really enjoyed it, and I'll see well, you next week. Bye bye. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye now.